Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and this is Innovators. My guest today is Marquez Brownlee, perhaps the world's greatest gadget reviewer. I didn't even know such a thing existed, but now that I know, he's the best one. You've been doing this since you were three years old or something, is that right? For a while, a number of years. More than a majority of my life. The most of your life, yeah. yeah. So more than half your life. And how old are you now? So I'm 22. You're getting old. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you, it's just <laughs> downhill from 22. So what'd you major in, in college? Majored in business and technology, and then minored, they call it a concentration, but I minored in information systems and marketing. So you were halfway there, given what you've been doing since childhood. Yeah, it's tied into a lot of what I do now. So. You're into gadgets? Yeah, into all kinds of tech. I got into cameras and I got into all the tech around me. And then this sort of merged into making videos about the tech. On a YouTube channel that's a hugely popular place for people to go. Right, and it didn't start that way. It started as just me making videos for like myself just to have that exist somewhere. Uh, and then slowly people started to discover it and then it sort of grew from that. Doesn't this cost money to, to review a gadget? You got to own the gadget. I was in school, so I was, I was using a laptop for school, so I reviewed the laptop. And I reviewed a bunch of free software on the laptop. Okay. So it was a bunch of things I already had. So not only gadgets, but software that might go on the gadget. And that's how it started. And then people who wanted to see, should I get this software or not, would find it. And then I started reviewing paid things that I bought, maybe the cooler for the laptop. That's the kind of stuff that got, got you off the ground. And then you sort of proceed to, to check out more elaborate or extravagant things. And then people come to depend on you. A little bit, a little bit, yeah. Especially I'm not buying it unless Marquez. When it's something you use as daily as like a smartphone, for example, that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing you do actually put a lot of research into and watch a whole bunch of videos on before you actually buy it. So when did you realize you started having a following? Because you don't exist on, yeah. in this world unless people care who you are. Yeah, a lot of the early videos were just for uh, people buying this one laptop. So it wasn't necessarily a lot of people watching. One of the, the turning points is a video I did about a web browser when Safari by Apple came to Windows. I made a video about that, woke up the next morning and I had a couple of thousand views from people who weren't subscribed. And that was kind of a light bulb moment, like, oh, people actually kind of care about this timely information. And, and by then you had just turned five years old. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was probably about 15, so okay. I'll give myself Same that. Same difference. <laughs> Okay, so now you're like 15, uh -huh. and now you got thousands of views on your review. And then I, I reviewed little things like a webcam or a keyboard, things that I bought for my laptop. Then I went to college, and I started to get into you know cameras, and uh, bought a different laptop, and it was sort of like a rolling snowball. And I've noticed on the internet, if you put out an opinion, people are, it's like their job to argue your opinion. Often, yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, how does what you say settle upon this, this torrid landscape of people's strongly held views? Because it's a review, a lot of what I do is at least try to stay consistent in my opinion. So even if you disagree with something that I say, maybe I, I say something like, oh, I like this phone's display because it's really saturated and punchy. And maybe you don't like that. You'll disagree with that. But at least in the next couple of phone reviews, when I say I like the display, you already know that you won't like the display for the same reasons that I do. So if it's consistent across a whole bunch of videos, then even if you disagree, you can learn from it. That's actually a profound lesson when following anyone. So what you're saying is people can accurately calibrate you right. to know when they're going to agree with you and when they're not. And that's useful no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. If the person's all over the place, you can't even, you don't know. And if you flip flop, then they'll call you out even more. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had complaints from the businesses themselves who put out the product? I get the can we follow up on that opinion sort of question oh. where, but often it's, a, it's in good nature because they actually want to improve their product. So if I have a criticism about something, they'll reach out and try to figure out what I don't like and they try to make it better, whether it's a software update or the next version of the product. So that actually turns out to work in a positive way. So you are shaping the future of manufacturing of a gadgets. A little bit, yeah. I feel like all of us reviewers have some so I'm taking that. Don't yeah. be saying all of us. You got the, you demand. Well, we all say things <laughs> that they might not like, but they don't have to reply to everyone. You're born 1994? 93. 93, December. okay. You've only really ever known the internet as a thing in your life, rather than having to have transitioned from walking to the library to get information and data. The internet is part of our life and always has been in a way that other generations 
exist alongside the internet and may go over and use it once in a while, everything we do now, whether it's communication or sharing anything with anyone, whether it's someone I know or just posting something for the world, all of it goes through the internet. The convenience stuff, like I said, where a normal going to work routine would have no internet involved in it in 1990. Today, it's relying upon Google Maps and, and my alarm clock on my phone and everything telling me when to wake up and when to leave and how to get there. So in that way, I do think we are completely tu tuned into the internet in a way that's not the same as any other generation. Yeah. But can I say, it's not that so much you're tuned into the internet, the internet's tuned into you. That, that also is true. Do you have and an I identity outside of how you are represented on the internet? It's almost like a pair of identities where you, you have your social life, but you have your social media life as well. And sometimes they're different. You'd be surprised how different they are with a single person having an online life versus an offline life. How, okay, how close are the two for you? For me, I'm the same person. We'll be the judge. Easy. We'll be the judge. I mean, you can, you can look it up. I'm out there. It's all the same. What about the eternity of the internet? The picture of you dancing on a table drunk at a party right. and now you're applying for a job. Yeah. So I'm father time here and I'm your grandfather. Yeah. And I say in my day, you didn't give anybody any information right. at all. Now you are putting all this information that I previously held secret, you're saying, here it is. Yeah. Here's my age, where I'm born, what schools I went to, who my friend circles are, it's all on, on the internet. So that's not even private. Yeah. And you're making it not private. I think people want to be able to control what shows up or not. A picture that someone else uploads that has you in it, you don't really have control over that, but you still have control over everything that you post. That's the difference. So you can at least prune that. What would you say has changed most since you were 15? I'll give two things. One, displays have impressed me a lot. and The quality and resolution. The quality, the crispness. detail, the crispiness, all that stuff. And also more recently, cameras. Cameras in smartphones, cameras in laptops, the, the front-facing cameras, but especially in smartphones, we've gotten a lot better. But the number one thing I'd say is the displays. How about handheld? What, 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 because for, the, for most of us, we're not thinking, gee, there's 20 things I wish they would invent and they haven't yet, because they're ahead of me at every step. Can you list some things that you know the rest of us can't live without and we don't know it yet? One of the things that I look forward to that I don't necessarily see up to snuff yet is battery life. On a mobile, a mobile phone, we never really had like a week or two week long battery life. If you took your phone out of your pocket five years ago, it was dead by the end of the day. Often two days maybe, if you're lucky. Today, your high-end phones are still dead by the end of one day, charge it every night. If battery technology can get to a point where physics will let you go for a week or two. And of course, battery technology is the most antiquated thing in a phone. It's straight chemistry. It's, it's straight chemistry from the 19th century. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. That's that lagging way behind exactly. other advances in the phone. Sure. And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, most of why anything is lasting longer at all is not so much because we're making better batteries, but because the power consumption has Efficiency. been dropping. Efficiency is one of the most important factors to battery life in the display and the electronics inside and all that stuff. That's the reason the battery life is any good. So, so batteries. Yeah. All right, so what, what next? What do you think should be invented that hasn't yet? That's like the golden question. If I knew, the, I, if I, knew I couldn't <laughs> tell you, I wouldn't even know. Wait, so you don't know what it is you can't live without yet? My job is to look at what these really high-end innovators are coming out with and critique it. And it's, it's going to be awesome and it's going to be new and it's going to be fantastic when it's efficient and, and available for everyone. But when it first comes out, us early adopters look at it and talk about the goods and the bads and I feel like that moves it forward. Maybe these companies, Apple and Microsoft, maybe they've got a little branch called, what does Marquez want? <laughs> That's like a, a yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we can make him happy. <laughs> In a lab behind like a red and black door. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. It's, it's a secret door. Yeah. They're trying to make you happy for what the next thing is. So we've crossed certain thresholds of d device innovation. Yeah. Uh, Apple might use the term retina display to describe a display where the pixel density is so great that your eye cannot discern individual pixels. Pretty much every phone has a retina display at this point, where five years ago that was not the case. And even the photos you take with the cameras getting so detailed and such high resolution that, again, the type of images you can take out of a camera on your smartphone are often better than something you'd get from a dedicated camera like seven, eight years ago. See, back in the day, you'd take a picture, 
in your camera, and it would have to stay in there until you finish the entire roll. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, in history books will tell Sounds you Sounds inconvenient. <laughs> you finish the whole roll, and you forget what the first few pictures were. Oh. You finally finish the roll, and then you walk it to a place, and they hold it for a week, and then you come back. And then, and then you you're at reminded it. of the photos. You then you're have. reminded of the photos. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so what are you going to be telling your kids? Honestly, I'm thinking cars. So I hope I get to say, like, back in the day, we actually had to hold the steering wheel. And when we wanted to turn, we'd, most of us would put the blinker on. Some of us weren't so good at that. But then we'd turn the wheel and move. And, and they'd say, wow, Dad, you had to have to move your arms. And we, and we had to put gasoline in it and would make this explosion in the car. Yeah, all this weird right, stuff. Right, they're little explosions. Yeah. All right, so I'll give you the self-driving car. Mm -hmm. That's already on the road. Not everybody has one yet. But it's not out of reach, philosophically or mentally. Is there something even beyond a self-driving car that you think would be amazing? I feel like a lot of the stuff we have now that's inside of a car that you have to control, like the steering wheel, even if you're in a self-driving car, they still want you at the controls in case something might go wrong because it's a computer and it's a system. The fact that you say that implies that something would go wrong with the machine yeah. that the human can correct. Right. Rather than something going wrong with the human that, that the machine. machine needs to correct. Yeah. <laughs> because last I checked, all those accidents on the street are, are humans, the humans messing up. For sure. But even the, the system's getting to the point where everyone has a car that is capable of driving itself. No one even needs that space of a steering wheel in the car. You just kind of sit down. It's maybe a bench facing another bench, and you just kind of ride along to your destination. I feel like that's way down the road where we're at the point where a car is sort of fusing into the next generation of vehicle at this point. Fascinating because we do get into self-driving vehicles and at airports any of those monorails there's no driver right and you just walk in and it's not going to kill you as the doors close yeah right they open up again if you get stuck mm. it tells you when to get on and off no one complains about it i'm always amazed when i see some people be concerned about a car taking control yeah just all the variables and all the human intervention possible you won't you don't see people like walk crossing the street in front of a monorail in an airport but you do see you know, construction signs and weird lane changes and all sorts of other human variables. Because the car's not on a track. Right, yeah. So, so that's basically an unlimited configuration of pathways. Yeah, which makes pathways. it a, sort of a mental block to allow a machine to just navigate that freely. So if cars do all the driving on the road, then in principle, you can up the speed limit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you're not at risk of reaction time. A car can way outperform a human mind. So I'm imagining you go 150, 200 miles an hour driving yeah. down the road. No problem. And they'll just weave seamlessly within each other in a way that would be scary if a human was trying to do it, but it'll just be totally normal. That's right, because if all the cars are going any high speed, yeah. then it's a moving coordinate system. That's the other thing. All the cars are sort of talking to each other as, as points in the matrix well, and they can all that. avoid each other because they already know if car all the way on the right lane with a bunch of stuff in between it knows it wants to go to the left and car all the way on the left knows it wants to go to the right and they can tell the cars around it, I'm trying to go to the right, I'm trying to go to the left. Human couldn't do that with another car on the other side of the road. No, you couldn't. But, but I mean, you can try. You can try, <laughs> but those, those machines can work with each other much more efficiently I than any human I never considered that. Yeah. Is there some value that people have to holding the steering wheel and driving a car that they would lose by letting the car drive itself. Yeah, I think it's just a mental thing. I think people... You think, we I think to, we'll, 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 we'll mature out of this Well, people problem. like driving. They like a loud, fast car that they can drift around a corner. So that's like a thing that people will hold on to. These are testosterone-laden men. Sure, but the other <laughs> thing... loud cars. Yeah, and, and then the other thing is I've sat in the, the driver's seat of a Tesla that has autopilot on. Even to like look away from the road for a second while it continues to drive, doesn't feel right. Like it's a, it's a sort of a mental block you're you have violating. to overcome. Yeah, so you're going 60 miles an hour behind a truck down a highway and you don't really want to look <laughs> off the road, but you totally can because it's totally fine. But it's still like up here that people will still be a little bit behind on. All right, so here's a car in charge of your trip. It's kind of already that way when you dial up a Google map mm -hmm. that tells you which direction where to go, where to go, and, and where to when turn. to go, and how to avoid traffic. That's some version of AI. So, do you have any sense where AI is taking us, and are the fear factors 
that many people have legitimate it's fear factors, of course, AI. of machines taking over our lives. Yeah, people getting scared about all the information. Ultimately committing homicide upon us. <laughs> Here's something I found that was really interesting. On my the phone. The movies tell us this. Uh, it's know. inevitable. Inevitable, apparently. of course. Uh, I have an app on my phone called Google Now. And if I go to class enough times with my phone in my pocket, it knows that I go there every day. So it puts that down as where I work, but it knows I go there every day. And if it's far enough away that I drive there every day, it'll start to show me a card in the morning of when I should leave based on traffic to get there on time because I go there the same time every day. Uh, if there's an accident, so it'll, it'll wake me up earlier to tell me you should head, on, head out earlier. Because there's there. an accident on the road. Because there. there's an accident on the road you're about to take to get to the place you're about to go. And all you're okay stuff, with all of it. I'm okay with all of it because it's helping me. People don't like to think that you know Google knows all this about us. They're going to use this information. I feel like if they're giving back this information to help me in this way, that's actually really useful. I'm okay with it. But at the, at the same time, I do understand the natural concern with all the information that's out there. Okay, that's that's access to you and your life's privacy. But what I'm specifically talking about now is AI. Mm -hmm. The fear that people have of a machine going out of control, mm -hmm. a machine judging that your decisions are not good today, in fact, you are a menace to society, you've got to have some thoughts about it. I've, I've, I haven't seen anything close enough to that that it has struck me as a concern. And maybe I haven't seen enough. But I've you said that like so we've politely. seen the I've seen the examples in fiction of this being a crazy scary thought, and I get that. While it is definitely a future problem, I don't really think of it uh, as an immediate issue. When you're the ripe old age of 32, how do you want to be living life? What how, what technology do you want to be surrounding you? I hope car tech is on another level. I hope that's the most exciting part. And that's the right horizon for this to kick yeah, in. Yeah, and it's going to do it. I hope. The, the handheld devices we have are no longer handheld. And that's pretty ambitious for 10 years, I think. But the Where communication. Are they? Are they? Well, someone would argue they're like in your arm or like on, attached. You've seen wearable tech, smartwatches, they kind of shrink down and, and end up on your wrist or on your ear or around your neck or something like that. But uh, how about the, the biology uh, technology the interface? Sort of interfusion? Yeah. It's Put a little USB thing right here. Yeah, right in, in your the neck. And they kind of did that in, in, no one called it that, but they were, they were USB ponytails in Avatar. Oh, right? oh. Remember oh, that? See Avatar. Right? They, they take their hair and they it's plug sort of it like into download. the plant. Yeah, yeah, and they, they would communicate with one another. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I see, though, is like a, a, a much more uh, portable but complete version of your, your digital self to just exist and be able to move around. Because you talk about getting them small, but of course, smartphones are getting larger. Smartphones, if you look at a smartphone from five years ago, and you put together the same exact uh, functionality in a smartphone today, it will be smaller. But smartphones do so much more today, and they happen to have bigger screens, which makes the whole thing bigger, and people, I have a five and a half inch screen in my pocket, which is unheard of five years ago, but they do so much more, and they're enabled by constant information downloading to it, I would, I would love to have a slightly smaller version of the extremely complicated versions of, of smartphones we have today. But then what will happen is the hardware will get better mm -hmm. and then they'll want to add stuff you haven't dreamt of yet right. into a phone that's the same size. So it'll be the same size but do way more. But do way more. I'm fine with that. You're fine with that? Yeah. Okay. What the hell is Pi doing in the middle of your shirt? Hi. Uh, I get just, I get the times divide. It's like an aesthetically pleasing simple symbol. Okay. How many decimal places do you know of pi? 3.14159265535. How many you get? 12. That's 12. You yeah, 12. I'm like six decimal places. I got it. 3.14159268. Eight. Eight. I got eight. There you go. That's it. <laughs> I'm putting that on my resume now. <laughs>